everybody. Good morning to Bakey CV online here uh, with John Cook. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences and our visiting professor today is Dr. Jordan Miller, Associate Professor of Surgery at Mayo Clinic, who gave uh, actually two fascinating talks today. We got two for the price of one. Um, first talk was on uh, his new therapy for aortic valve disease. Uh, which looks very promising in its uh, phase two study. And uh, we also heard something fascinating about senolytic therapies. Uh, we're going to hear about that from Dr. Miller in just a moment. Um, but first, uh, Dr. Miller, would you tell us a little bit about uh, your background? You're coming uh, originally from um, the Midwest. You, you got your training in the Midwest at um, one of the best places for vascular biology in the country at uh, University of Iowa, your postdoc with Don Heistad. Right. Tell us a little bit about uh, what, what brought you to science, vascular biology, and uh, cardiovascular care. Yeah, well, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. And, uh, you know, it's been, um, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting road where um, during, my, during my doctoral training at University of Wisconsin, it was actually an uh, integrative cardiovascular control uh, laboratory that I worked in. And so, uh, prior to working with Don Heisted at Iowa, and so there, we realized that uh, that we needed to have uh, more of a reductionist approach, more mechanistic approach. After mm -hmm. my doctoral work, and so we uh, we moved down to uh, University of Iowa to work with Don Heisted, who really was a pioneer in many ways to move from integrative cardiovascular biology to reductionist approaches. Uh, and more mechanistic work, and so. And there, you started to work with Don Heistad on aortic valve calcification. Uh, absolutely, yes. It was, uh, it was a truly a serendipitous finding where uh, we had I'd originally moved there to work on vascular biology, and, and within the first few weeks, we had we had stumbled upon this uh, this mouse model of aortic valve stenosis, and uh, and Don and I sort of looked at each other and thought, well, this is. Uh, this is a really exciting area, a really unique model, mm -hmm. and, um, and he said, "Well, we should we should really pursue this full speed." And, and so it's been. And you did some great work uh, understanding some of the mechanisms behind aortic valve calcification. Tell us a little bit about that, the mechanisms that cause the aortic valve to calcify. Yeah, so we had really built on, uh, you know, some of the uh, initial work that, uh, reports that were done in the early 2000s that related to osteogenic signaling in the valve, or this formation Osteogenic of meaning bone, bone -like forming. cells bone right forming. in the valve. And, um, and so what we had showed was that, uh, that nitric oxide signaling, or this protective molecule. Uh, My favorite molecule, Exactly, right. The loss of nitric mm -hmm. oxide was a, a really important permissive step in allowing valves to calcify, and that it really happened uh, selectively in this microenvironment. That, where that is was so occurring. fascinating, because nitric oxide, I think of, is a vasodilator. And, and the, it, the three American pharmacologists got the Nobel Prize, what, in 1992, I think, mm -hmm. for for their discovery of nitric oxide and its importance for vascular homeostasis. But now we're finding from your work that it also is involved in valvular homeostasis. Right, and that I think was the very exciting part about it is that it really was a paradigm shift to, to, to nitric oxide just not being this mediator of vascular tone or stiffness, but now it was really playing a significant role in aortic valve calcification, which is a fundamentally different process. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, nitric oxide, such a simple molecule, NO, nitric oxide, yep. a gas yeah. generated by cells as a transmitter of information. And in the, in the vasculature, it relaxes the blood vessel, it prevents monocytes, uh, platelets from sticking to the vessel wall, it gives the the vessel wall, its Teflon-like character when it's functioning mm -hmm. normally, prevents vascular thickening. But now you're saying that it also prevents bone formation in the aortic valve. Uh, right, and I think that that is the two parts of that are saying. One is, is it bo it prevents bone formation in the valve, and it also doesn't do anything negative to to the actual bone, to orthotopic bone. Uh, so th therapeutically, it's it's critical to be able to prevent calcium where you don't want it, but preserve calcification where you do want it. And that's the unique part about NO. 
So it's, it's fascinating science, but how do you make a drug out of this uh, observation? I mean, if you could uh, mod modulate this pathway, presumably you could slow the progression of aortic valve calcification. And that, I think that has been the challenge to, to biologists and clinicians for quite some time. Uh, we've known that nitric oxide is broadly protective, but now how do you harness that effectively? Uh, how do you harness something that causes vasodilation, and when you get too much of it, you might have hypotension? And so really, for us, what it was was searching for a drug that, uh, that selectively activated or restored nitric oxide signaling mostly and selectively in these, in these disease tissues. And that's where we were able to find, uh, find a Tosiglot, a, a drug mm -hmm. that really works preferentially at the sites of disease and, and less preferentially in healthy tissues. So a Tosiglot strengthens the nitric oxide signaling Right. Pathway. Correct. And and uh, enhances the action of nitric oxide to prevent this abnormal bone formation in the valve. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit. What's the mechanism there? How does that work? How does a tasiguat strengthen nitric oxide signaling? So uh, what we what we knew from the work that uh, that we had done in Iowa was that in in the valve uh, in the disease valve that there are high levels of oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. Right. And so those levels of oxidative stress ends up end up uh, damaging uh, the SGC, this, uh, the target of nitric oxide, soluble guanylate cyclase. And so when it's damaged, nitric oxide can't bind to SGC and exert its protective effect. So this SGC, this is the protein that nitric oxide is acting on Correct. Right. to cause, in the blood vessel, vasodilation, vasodilation, in the valve to prevent bone formation. Right, in the valve to prevent bone formation, right? So, so when the, there, there's a high level oxidative stress in the valve, Nitric oxide can no longer bind to SGC, um, and, and, and that allows for bone formation mm -hmm. in the valves. Now, a tosiguat comes and binds selectively to that oxidized or damaged form of SGC. So it's really only in the areas where there is uh, a high level of, of oxidative stress that a tosiguat exerts its protective effects, mm -hmm. which we think is, is why it's, it's so uh, efficacious as well uh, and effective, as well as has so few side effects mm -hmm. with uh, long-term treatment in, in humans. You went on with Don Heistad to show that uh, a Tasaguat could could reduce, uh, or actually you did this yourself at Mayo Clinic, I think, is, is you went, you took the, that, that mechanism and, and, and studied a Tasaguat in an animal, so uh, right. an animal model, and, and showed that a Tasaguat could prevent um, valve calcification in an animal model, and then you took the brave step of, of doing a clinical trial. Right. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the clinical trial that you, you've done with the Tasaguat? So the clinical trial, uh, it, again, it was, uh, it was really catalyzed by our, uh, our clinical uh, collaborators, Marie Serrano, uh, Hector Michelena, Hartzell Schaff, you know, they were instrumental in helping us move. Hartzell Schaff, one of the one cardiovascular surgeons, surgeons at Mayo Clinic. So for us to move from, from bench to bedside in an expeditious manner, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to have robust clinical colleagues. And so they were really working closely with us and understanding biologically what was going on in our animal models. So when we moved from, from functionally bench to bedside in a phase two clinical trial, uh, there, we, we uh, leveraged the clinical insights of our colleagues in cardiology to say, Who's going to be the patient population that benefits? Who are mm -hmm. the rapid progressing patients? And how can we follow up these patients in a meaningful uh, period of time to demonstrate that uh, this drug might actually have a shot at being cl uh, clinically viable? Mm -hmm. And so there, uh, we, we had followed patients up for, for six months. Um, and uh, there, was, there was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. So uh, nobody knew what anybody was getting, and, um, and these patients had uh, CT scans and echocardiograms at uh, baseline in six months. And, uh, and at the end, uh, when we unblinded and analyzed the data, uh, we were fortunate to find that, that a Tosquat slowed progression of valve calcification by about 70%. Mm -hmm. So we we're quite excited by that. that is spectacular. This is the first drug that shows promise in a clinical trial of slowing the progression of aortic valve calcification. That, that is spectacular. And it actually brings us to a question from one of our uh, 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 t uh, audience. Um, if money and time were not barriers, please describe a study that you would like to conduct within the next five years. I guess it <laughs> leads, leads into what you are planning to do now. Right, yeah. So we, you know, with, with the Tosiguat, 
it's a ex very exciting time, right? Mm -hmm. And and you know, we are we are hopeful that we'll be able to launch a, a phase three trial to, to really demonstrate uh, effectiveness of uh, the hot squat in a larger patient population, uh, and 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 bring that to uh, to patient care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think at the same time. Uh, you know, while, while we're passionate about advancing these technologies in aortic valve disease, there's still the broader problem of all of these cardiovascular morbidities and mortalities that are, that are contributing to to uh, societal problems in the United States and other developed developed countries. And there, we think that you know maybe the emergence of these other drugs, these senolytic drugs, uh, that those might be uh, a viable strategy to prevent mm -hmm. multiple cardiovascular diseases. And so. If you said, well, if you could do anything uh, that would be disruptive in the next five years, what might that be? Mm -hmm. um, it, I think really it, it would be the strategic execution of, of, a, of, of phase two trials mm -hmm. of multiple cardiovascular conditions with multiple drugs targeting senescent cells to say, how can we understand what the role of senescent cells or senescent mm -hmm. cell subtypes are? in progression of multiple cardiovascular diseases so we can have as, as broad of impact as possible. That, that's fascinating. But before we get to the senolytics, yeah. I just want to finish with the Tassiguat because yeah. that does look promising in, in your early trials. Yes. And so you're a scientist, you're working with clinicians, um, you really don't have any significant pharma support for this other than getting the drug. Right. Um, uh, how, what are you going to do to take the next step to fund the phase three clinical trials, because they're expensive. How does a scientist they're, working with clinicians do that? Well, the, the reality is, is, that, uh, is that it requires the formation of, of a company. And it, you know, that's what we're working towards right now is, is the formation of a vehicle that will allow us to advance this to phase three trials. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so for us, uh, it, it's, it's uncommon to be at this stage of, mm -hmm. a of a successful phase two trial in academia. Mm -hmm. uh, and at a medical institution, and so, um, so we are we are dedicated to ensuring that this moves forward. We think that the, probably the best strategy to do it um, is via formation of a company, because uh, uh, the National Heart Lung Blood Institute uh, really doesn't have the resources to it, fund it these, does these not three types of, of trials. It doesn't phase. The, it doesn't fund those kinds of yeah. that kind of work. So uh, that that's spectacular. I think what what you've illustrated for us. Uh, Today in, in your in your lecture and just now in your in talk is is the, the why it's important for the scientists to, to work with the clinicians because the clinic the clinicians have the insights into the disease uh, that, uh, that 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 can help the scientists direct their their work in a way that results in something meaningful and I, I think you you illustrated that beautifully and once you make that translation you need to have funding to go further forward into the clinical trials that are ultimately going to lead to something useful for people. So congratulations with Thank that and, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. Before we finish today though, I would like to give you a chance to talk about senolytics mm -hmm. and uh, tell us first of all, what is a senolytic and what is senescence? Uh, so, right, so, uh, so uh, maybe we can start uh, with senescence. So senescence is a, is a process uh, that's initiated in the body to prevent cells from dividing. So in response to DNA damage or other cell uh, or chronic inflammation or injury, senescence is often induced uh, to prevent further cell division. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in, in young, healthy individuals, these senescent cells, they prevent cancer. Uh, and they end up being cleared effectively by the immune system. So are you saying that aging is an adaptation? It's, it's a way of, of uh, what, remodeling, of preventing cancer? Well, well so I think that uh, induction of senescence is a mechanism to prevent cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, but in the absence of the effective clearance of those cells, that's what we think uh, the accumulation of these senescent cells over time appears to be a, a relatively conserved phenomenon that is associated with a lot of diseases. Mm -hmm. And so if, if for us, if we said, well, if where's a way for us to selectively clear those cells or remove those cells, um, would that prevent numerous uh, cardiovascular and other morbidities associated mm -hmm. with aging? And and, and so the, 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 the strategy to do this has really been championed by uh, Jim Kirkland and, and Tamara Ciccone, our collaborators at uh, Mayo Clinic, where 
where they ask the question, well, if we, if we disable some of the, of the, of the uh, pathways in the cell that, that allow them to survive for so long. The senescent uh, cells. Of the senescent cells. Um, does that, does that allow those cells to basically undergo apoptosis or, or functionally kill themselves while leaving many of the other uh, healthy cells intact? And so as it turns out, it looks like that actually works. And so that class of drugs, which we refer to as senolytics, uh, really allows cells to undergo this programmed cell death and, and reduce senescent cell burden in, in a number of tissue types. Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating, that, that senescence is actually, it's a physiological adaptation to prevent cells from dividing, to prevent cells that have been damaged Correct. from dividing. Right. And, then, and, then, and really the problem with aging is not senescence per se, but it's, it's, it's clearing the senescent right. cells, that's it's, what you're saying. It is the accumulation of those cells over mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. uh, and the failure to clear them. So how do we enable clearance or how do we enable the removal of those cells is really at the core of the biology that enables the therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, sen senolytic strategy then is getting rid of those senescent Absolutely. cells. Absolutely, yes. So um, you, you, s you mentioned today, and I've heard your uh, colleague James Kirkland talk about really superb preclinical data, animal studies supporting um, the use of senolytics to reverse aging mm -hmm. and, and to clear these senescent cells that are making the other cells sick. Um, Tell us what we know from the uh, clinical observations, uh, the importance of senescent cells, uh, and the, the evidence that getting rid of them can have some benefit. Tell us about the, the clinical data that supports so that. So I think the early clinical data is just, uh, it's just beginning to, 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 to come out now. And so I would say that uh, so far uh, at, at, with Mayo uh, investigators, there have been trials in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, in a recent trial in, uh, in diabetic uh, nephropathy that suggests that clearing senescent cells uh, may start to impart some therapeutic benefit. And the challenge is, is to say, well, how do, we, how do we assess whether we're really reducing the senescent cells? That, that would be question number one. And then question number two is, well, what's the real benefit to those? Mm -hmm. and, and so much like our studies with, with uh, aortic valve disease, I think the critical questions for those phase two trials or those early trials is to say, how do we interface with our clinical colleagues to identify what uh, viable endpoints are there to, to, to give us a, a sense of how effective they are? Mm -hmm. I think we can measure changes in senescent cell burden in fat tissue, in skin tissue. I think the data are really starting to support uh, that some drugs can reduce senescent cell burden in those tissue mm -hmm. types. Um, I think in terms of the ultimate clinical benefit, I think that has yet to be realized. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're, we're, from a foundational perspective, starting to lay that foundation to say the drugs are likely to work mm -hmm. in certain cell types. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we identify the best endpoints to, mm -hmm. to move forward with those trials? We've got some more questions com coming up from our audience. and. Um, I get, if we could just uh, talk about how apoptotic cells are engulfed and cleared by macrophage, the, the process called ephrocytosis. Um, is, is, uh, how is that mechanism disturbed uh, with, uh, in senescent cells? I mean, so the senescent cells are not being cleared with, with aging. How is that mechanism disturbed? Right, and, and so normally again, in, in young individuals, uh, the senescent cells are cleared relatively mm -hmm. effectively. And I think w with increasing age, I think there are two, two significant tri contributors. Mm -hmm. One is reductions in immune cell function with, uh, with increasing age or immunosenescence, if mm -hmm. you will. Uh, and so the immune cells aren't just, uh, just aren't functioning as well as they do in a young individual to identify cells and remove them in senescent cells. The other is, is on the senescent cells themselves, which, which, and, and which these signals, uh, these cloaking mechanisms uh, that relate to ephrocytosis, often referred to as don't eat me signals, uh, they prevent macrophages and other immune cells from actually finding the senescent cells. Mm -hmm. And so that combination of probably not being as effective of a, 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 a immune cell circulating around in elderly individuals combined with this cloaking mechanism really is that, uh, that double hit that allows for the time-dependent accumulation of senescent cells. And, and so there, you know, senolytic drugs probably you know, uh, operate around that uh, mechanism um, you know, to, to enable cell death. 
-hmm. but, um, but there are other strategies that very well could work uh, to help identify those cells and have them clear back. So that's, that's very interesting. So that, that uh, senescent cells and cancer cells um, take advantage of the fact that as you get older, your immune system isn't working as well, right. can't clear yes. those cells as well. And they also make these don't eat me proteins that cloak them, that, that prevent right. uh, them from being recognized by the immune system. Um, got some, some more questions popping up on the screen. Um, let's go back for a moment to Atasaguat okay. and, and uh, uh, preventing calcification. Um, the question uh, uh, that we have uh, is, can, if you can prevent aortic valve calcification, with Atasaguat. Your, your early clinical studies mm -hmm. are promising. Mm -hmm. yep. Can you prevent calcification in other areas? Va a vascular calcification is a, is a big problem in, right. in the elderly. Tell us uh, what your thoughts are about that. Well, I think um, the, the, the answer is, is possibly, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, when we look at aortic versus aortic valve calcification, there are differences. There are molecular differences between the two. Um, and then at the valve, there really does appear to be a robust conservation of the whole BMP or bone morphogenetic protein signaling cascade, which mm -hmm. drives this bone formation. And in blood vessels, uh, we tend to see disruptions at certain points that, uh, that, that might not allow for the full uh, conservation of that signaling mechanism uh, uh, to contribute to vascular calcification. So what we don't know is how much of the calcification in a vessel really is due to bone-like cells and how much of that is due to uh, what is often referred to as dystrophic or much more disorganized uh, calcium or coral, second to, secondary to uh, vascular or smooth muscle cell death or macrophage death there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question I think biologically, we're still trying to tease out the relative contributions of these active versus somewhat passive mechanisms that contribute to calcification. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's, it's certainly a challenge clinically, and, um, and the short answer is we, is we don't really know whether atosaquat will be effective at reducing vascular calcification. Yeah. That's, uh, that's fascinating. So there may be different mechanisms of cal aberrant calcification. Right. Um, that may, maybe a tensegrade will work great in valve calcification, but not so well in vascular calcification. I guess, but the, 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 on the flip side, on the positive side, the, the, there may be different therapeutic avenues then too, if you can understand the mechanisms. For example, in chronic renal failure, you've got this, this disseminated calcification right. um, in, the, in the vessels. Do you have any thoughts about that, about mechanisms there that Again, may be different from valve calcification? I think they are different from uh, normal age-associated uh, vascular and valvular calcification. And um, the, I think uh, when we look at, for example, statins, which we know are very effective in treating uh, uh, vascular disease, but have, have failed in three large trials of valve disease. Mm -hmm. I think that just therapeutically, there, that there are, there, there's, uh, clinically, there are strong data that would suggest there are different entities. Mm -hmm. And so when we're looking at chronic kidney disease, for example, uh, again, high phosphate being a major driver of uh, the ectopic calcification of those contexts. Mm -hmm. um, it, how do we intervene in a meaningful way that's driven by biology and informed by clinical practice to understand what's going to be viable therapeutically for these mm -hmm. patients? I mean, that's that intersection that is it's absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're coming close to the end of the interview, but I did want, there's one other question I think is worth uh, asking from the, the audience, and that was, um, you t take us back to Mayo Clinic where you were just getting ready to do this phase one clinical trial. You had the preclinical mm -hmm. data that was supportive of uh, the Atasaguat's effect in valve calcification. Mm -hmm. um, what were your biggest hurdles in getting that first human trial going, your phase one study going uh, with Atasaguat? The biggest hurdles, you know, it, it probably relates to the uh, to to the true translational effort uh, sort of for the first time when, when you're going through this. And so mm -hmm. uh, interfacing with the FDA, preparing uh, an investigation on a new drug application, really thinking through carefully, uh, you know, what is the safest way to implement this drug testing strategy in, in patients. Uh, you know, for a scientist, mm -hmm. these are all questions that 
you need to be involved with. I would argue that scientists need to be empowered to be involved with those decisions and those mm -hmm. discussions because, because as a scientist, we have the greatest biological understanding mm -hmm. of, of, of how these drugs work. Mm -hmm. But similarly, at the same time, uh, the clinicians have to be an instrumental part of those conversations mm -hmm. as well. So how do you have everybody come together um, to really appropriately design a trial, uh, identify the resources that are required within the institution, we have a terrific regulatory group at Mayo mm -hmm. Clinic, our uh, clinical and translational uh, science uh, center there has been really uh, instrumental in providing resources for us to, to work through the FDA process, the regulatory process, putting together uh, institution review board applications. It is mm -hmm. just, it's a tremendous amount of, uh, of just overall work to, uh, mm -hmm. to move from bench to bedside. And, mm -hmm. and it and involves the formation of a huge team to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think if you try to do it all yourself, I think, I think pretty soon you'll find out that you can't. you can't. And so then how do you find those resources within your institutions and really have institutional mm -hmm. dedication to the activities that you're Beautiful. And that's so you need an integrated, multidisciplinary team. You need the scientists talking to the clinicians, talking to the people with regulatory expertise. You need the institutional support for it this, uh, for this activity, and it, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of people uh, to push something from the basic science arena into the clinic. And congratulations on thank you on what you've done, Jordan. Really spectacular. Thank you for visiting us today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I think that concludes our interview today. Thank you for joining us on Debakey CV, and uh, we look forward to having you join us next time. Thank you, Jordan. That was Thanks so much. Really, that was really terrific. Good. Yeah.